Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, we're so happy to have you here today for our second in a series of presentations designed specifically for you, students and teachers of Recruiting Washington Teachers and Bilingual Educator Initiative programs around the state. Um, my name is Stacy Souders. I work at the Professional Educator Standards Board and specifically work on supporting these programs and we're happy to have you here today. I'd like to have my colleague Zoe introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Zoe Hamas Hefty. Um, I work with Stacy at the Professional Educator Standards Board and I work specifically for the Paraeducator Board um, and implementing the new professional development for paraeducators in the state of Washington. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. So um, a little bit about how the meeting is set up. So we're gonna be reading questions um, and comments from the chat. Uh, Erica is totally down to make this an interactive uh, presentation. So if you guys have a question, you can either put it in the chat or you can um, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, so we're going to put all of the, this in the chat for your reference, but we definitely encourage participation. So as the presentation proceeds, if you have a question or even a comment, you can let us know in a variety of ways. So use the raise hand zoom feature. Um, you can turn on your camera and raise your actual hand. Um, or you can type your question or comment into the chat and one of the facilitators will call on you or read it out loud um, for you. So I just also want to let you guys know that we're going to be recording the presentation um, to show those who are unable to attend here with us today. If you have your camera on, your video image will not be in the recording. So you're more than welcome to put your video on. We're not going to be sharing that around. If you unmute yourself to ask a question or make a comment, your voice will be in the recording, so please be aware of that. And um, I can see a fair number of uh, instructors and program staff in the um, participant list, so that's great. I did send out a request that each program designate a student to introduce your school and your group or program at the beginning, so just pre be prepared for that. Um, that'll happen just here in a moment. And Finally, we do want to really center the experience of students. Um, as with the last presentation, we really do ask that adults, adults take more of an observer role. And now uh, we would like to hand things over to our presenter who some of you may remember from previous presentations, Dr. Erica Hernandez Scott. Good afternoon. We will we'll get started with our, um, our usual land acknowledgement and moment of silence. And then we will jump into this conversation together. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here today. We would like to acknowledge that no matter where each of us are physically, we are on the traditional lands of Native Americans whose ancestors were the original inhabitants. As we proceed with our presentation today and our work, let's make sure that our deliberations, ideas, recommendations benefit the descendants of these Native Americans equitably. Um, we would also like to acknowledge the history of this nation, one fraught with contradictions. For too long, this country has elevated a story of democracy and freedom while minimizing the impact of violence and oppression on marginalized communities, communities on whose backs this nation was built. Today, members of our Black and Asian communities and other communities of color continue to experience racism through police brutality, mass incarceration, inequitable education and health services, deportation, and other forms of subjugation. We aim to disrupt the legacy of systemic racism by centering racial equity and justice in our work. This is how we stand with our communities of color. So before we begin the presentation today, we want to offer a moment of silence to consider these words and how you might join us in this work. Thanks, Stacy and Zoe for the land acknowledgement in the moment of silence. Well, we know from history, uh, actually I'm, I'm reading a book called Deculturalization and the Struggle for Equality, A Brief History of Education. I'm sorry, Erica, that was a mouse error on my part. Okay, <laughs> did you catch any of that? 
No, I was trying to admit someone and um, so nope, you got to start from the beginning. <laughs> so I will, I will start from the beginning. I can do that. So um, we have this land acknowledgement and we have this moment of silence is our way of acknowledging um, that there are things in the history of the past and the present that have done harm to to people who've been historically underserved by schools. And I'm reading this book right now that I showed you a picture of that's backwards. Um, Deculturalization and the Struggle for Equality, A Brief History of Education of Dominated Cultures in the United States. And it's all about how people have used schools to do harm to uh, different cultural groups. And when you sometimes when you read the history and you look at all of these things that are happening in the world, you might think, what can I even do? What can one person even do? And uh, what we're going to be doing today is thinking about not just what can one person do, but what can you do right now as an RWT student? So th today is about us thinking about justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, I was just telling my colleagues before this meeting got started, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, the first letters of those of those words stand for Jedi. So that's why I got the Star Wars theme. Uh, somebody else's idea, I thought it was cute. They make t-shirts and sell them. Um, so we're gonna be thinking about what does this have to do with you and what you can do in schools? So I know that you all um, have things to say about your experience. Some of you might've been worked, might've had opportunities to work in schools already. Some of you might be looking forward to that. Some of you might be doing that virtually. Um, all of those experiences are valid and can be connected to what we're doing today. But I wanted to give you some little nuggets of things that if you went into a school, you could start advocating for justice and helping students like just with very small doable things every day. You see on my slide uh, after my name, my first name, Erica, E-R-I-C-A, I wrote it phonetically. That means I wrote it how it sounds. So it says air, Ica. So if you have a name um, that people frequently mispronounce, um, I would like for you to, to type it phonetically on your Zoom window. So when we say it, we say it correctly. Um, that's really important, especially um, for very young students. Some people go years and have adults mispronounce their name. Uh, and if you are so inclined, please include uh, the pronouns that you use because it's uh, 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 wrong for us to assume a person's gender. So uh, Erica, Hernandez Scott, she, her, you can, she, her, the pronouns that I use to refer to how I identify myself. So now that I've told you a little bit about me, I want to know who's with me today. I heard there was some new schools being represented last time I did this on a Tuesday so there might be new schools where are you at who are my people who are supposed to be introducing themselves I need some spirit who's who's with me yes that's us um we are Diego and Amelia and we are part of the Pas Pasco High School Teaching Academy Pasco in the house who We're else? located in Pasco, Washington, which is actually in South Central Washington. I think I drove through there once. I'm not from here, so I'm like, Pasco, I've seen that sign. All yeah. right, who else is here? Is there anyone else or is it just Pasco today? Hi, Erica. This is Leslie from the Marysville and Everett Consortium. We may or may not have some students present. Today is an asynchronous day, but there might be a couple. Just wanted to let you know we're here. All right. Those are my original homies from out there in Everett, Marysville. All right. Anyone else? Hi, Erica. Um, I'm Katia from the Quincy School District. I don't know if any of our students are here quite yet, but our schedules are all over the place, so they'll be mm -hmm. joining in shortly. Great. Well, I'm a, whether they come in now or later, they are all are welcome. They can jump in, uh, ask whatever questions they need. I just want to make sure that um, that 
that there are real people out there because I can only see a few little windows on my screen. Um, but yes, please feel free to like use the raise hand or to put comment or question in the chat box. This is in no way meant to be me talking at you for an hour. This is really uh, meant to be a discussion. So we can get on with those things. All right, here we go. So what I was when I was preparing for this, Stacy and I were talking about, well, what kinds of things do you do in your practicum? In another life, I was a classroom teacher and I also uh, worked at the university as faculty about a dozen years. And I went out into schools to help um, pre-service teachers with their practicum. And these were some of the exact same things that they were learning. How do we make sure that student experiences are in the curriculum? What does the classroom setup look like and its structure? How can we see diversity and relationships in that? Um, how do we make sure there's shared inquiry and dialogue? What does that even mean? Um, I can tell you what that means in a couple of minutes, like it's very fancy ways of talking about talking. And um, what do you need? What tools do you need to build social emotional safety that reflect fairness, equity, and cultural awareness? And you'll hear that, you'll hear a lot about social emotional learning and um, those expectations. I'm going to try to break them down to very small chunks of things that you could do any Wednesday you walked into a classroom with any group of students um, and that would become more and more meaningful the more time you spend with those students. So let's let's take a look at my first set of examples. So curriculum. That I always remember hearing that word when I was a student, curriculum, curriculum. It sounds very fancy. Curriculum is just the stuff teachers teach. That's the stuff you're supposed to learn. So how do we know if a curriculum is good? Well, one thing we can look at is does the teacher make real world connections? Like, is this just about what happens in a book or can we make an example of how this lives in real life? So when you go into a classroom on a Wednesday, whether that be face-to-face -face or virtually, if you can provide as many concrete examples of where something exists in your life. So for example, when I was teaching fourth grade, I have a sister that's three years younger than me and I had to teach fractions. And, I, and they'd always say, why do we need no fractions? They're so hard, there's extra numbers. What's this line for? And I go, do you have any brothers or sisters? Do you have any siblings? Yeah. You ever have to share? Yeah. You ever have to share half? Yeah. You ever keep that bigger half for yourself? And I'm, and they're like, yeah. I was like, that wasn't really half. That was two parts, but they were not two equal parts. So if you don't know fractions, you don't know if you're getting an equal share, right? So I was breaking it all the way down to, is half really half? Or do you play around with what half means when you're trying to cheat your little sister like I did every time I had to share something with her? That is a real world connection. I had to understand what is it like to be an eight-year-old that has to share and recognize all the challenge with that. So that's an example of a real world connection that a teacher can provide students. If you're looking to see um, what are some, our student interests represented here? Well, one of the things you wanna do if you wanna know what students are interested in is listen to them. You can learn so much from just listening to, to kids and to, to students. What do they talk about when they're at lunch, when they're on breaks, when they're at recess? Um, are there, is there music they're listening to? Is there a particular TikTok challenge that's happening right now that you see them practicing when they're supposed to be doing other things? Each one of those little things that you observe in the moment, that is like a little treasure that you can use later and bring back into a lesson. So you could say, oh, I know that you all are watching TikTok videos because I've seen you practicing 
when you're supposed to be doing other things, but you know what else is on TikTok? Science experiments gone awry. Let's take a look at one of them and figure out how I can tie this interest with TikTok into science. Next thing you know, you yeah, get folks looking up science videos on TikTok and they're like, oh, the teacher tricked me into learning. Absolutely. Just from paying attention to what they do, all of a sudden that stuff that kids have to learn in the curriculum becomes more interesting. What examples do you have from your learning where the teacher either made a real world connection or the student interests were brought in to a lesson that all of a sudden this thing that might have been boring is now much more interesting? Do you have any examples like that? Chances are, if you think back to a year in school or a particular teacher that for some reason they just, they stuck with you what they did, you probably have some kind of experience that you're still thinking about. I mean, I've been out of school for a long time, but the TikTok mm -hmm. example is really interesting because I think part of what you're pointing out is the relational experience to students, right? And that personal connection. Mm -hmm. And so some of my younger coworkers in the room know that I am always trying to figure out a way to connect with them via TikTok. And so I think it's, to me, that really resonates in terms of an example of a way to start building and deepen a relationship. Mm-hmm. Madison also put in the chat, uh, she had a teacher in eighth grade who um, made it a point to have a relationship with all the students and to make learning fun. So it made the students want to learn. And I think the TikTok example goes to show that like if you try to make a relationship with students, um, it just makes them more engaged with the not so fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I will share another example from the chat of uh, getting students involved when a teacher asks students for their opinion on racism because they, um, and I quote, they don't really ask us younger people about how we feel about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And sometimes, sometimes you have to take, in order for the curriculum to make sense, right? Um, sometimes you have to make a connection to what's happening now. So let's say you're learning a uh, history and you're learning about Jim Crow laws and, and things that happened 200 years ago, and you're trying to figure out how do I make this real to students who like are very connected, right? We're on TikTok, we got our phones, we're like, their lives are nothing like they were 200 years ago. How in the world do I help them connect? Well, you do know what it's like to be treated unfairly. Right. What are those examples where you were treated unfairly and you knew somebody was getting away with something that you couldn't get away with? Right. It, you can and you can talk to four year olds about when something is not fair. They might not be able to pronounce all the words, but they know <laughs> you can talk to four year olds about race and racism because they can tell you when something is wrong, when they feel that something is wrong. Um, so you definitely want to be thinking about some of these examples. And to this day, anytime I go shopping or um, anytime I hear a song, <laughs> I'm not going to give you any songs and date myself so you know how old I actually am. But I will tell you that I often will take a song and remix the words and make it about something else about, um, I'm trying to think, there was... Okay, I will date myself. So there was a Drake song, Hotline Bling, and it was all about how students were always on my phone asking me for extensions on papers and things like that. I'd had the whole thing. It was so funny. 
And when I ask students, I'm like, okay, we're at the end, you finished reading this book. I want you to tell me what this book is about and what you have to do is remix a song. And you have to find a song that you know and you like and remix it. And the remix has to be about what this book was about. All of a sudden, everyone's like, oh no, you, we have to make a video. I'm like, yep, I made one. You can make one. And all of a sudden, people are more interested. Shy people, it's shy people didn't like it very much, but I let them work with partners so the shy person could help in other ways. So always be thinking about how to make things fun, just not so fun that you lose the focus on the things that you're supposed to learn. You can do both. Um, I just want to share two more comments for, mm -hmm. from the chat for your consideration. So um, one, I feel more connected when teachers talk to us about how they struggle too, and it shows that they're people and aren't just giving us work. Uh, and then a um, interesting comment that usually the deeper connections are made with teachers that are part of your same culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same culture often makes it easier to figure out like what someone might be interested or what they might like, but it doesn't have to be because if you're observant and you pay attention, you can, um, you can look for things that you might um, kind of tap into. So here's another example, classroom setup and structure. Um, how do I know if teachers have relationships with students? If you're going into a practicum, there's a group of students you've never met before. How can you show them that you wanna have a relationship with them? Well, you can use a student's name when you talk to them and pronounce it correctly. It's, I know that seems weird, but some students are quiet and they might go all day long without anyone saying their name out loud. So if you're in a classroom one day a week, when you're there with students, you look that student in the face and you say their name, you speak it out loud. And if you're like, there's so many students, it's really hard to learn names. You go into the classroom, you draw a seating chart of where students are seated, and you write their names on there. And if you're like, they have a name or they're from a culture I'm not familiar with and I'm not sure I can pronounce it, you write it phonetically the way I told you at the beginning to make sure that when you come back to them next time, you look at your seating chart, you look at the name, you see how it sounds and you say it out loud and you're like, and then you ask them, did I get it right? You know, and if they have a name that other people would find hard to pronounce, they're gonna feel connected to you for taking that little bit of time of drawing the seating chart and making sure you say the name correctly every single time. And that is so hard. And the more, um, the, the more culturally different you are, the more likely people are to say your name wrong. And that means the more important it is to say it correctly. Uh, I saw, a a light in the chat. Did we have a comment on that or a question? Yeah, Amelia was just saying simple things like that can make students feel more connected with the people and their environment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll have students who say, um, this is the name that, that it says on the roster. That says Susie, but I go by Suzanne. You know, there was a student in my high school, his name was Ryan, R-Y-A-N, but he wanted people to pronounce it Ariane. I was like, that's kind of fly. Yes, we will all call you Ariane. You know, it doesn't, those things don't, like whatever it takes to honor the person in front of you, go for it. You know, if they have a nickname in my family, everyone has a nickname. Fonts, Tita, Rika, Gina, Chinch. Everybody has, nobody, has, we all have legal names, but they're never used at home. Some classrooms, nicknames are totally fine. That's totally fine. Um, if you want to know if students have relationships with each other, right, let's say you want, you're like, the kids are great with the adults, but they're not nice to each other, and that doesn't feel good when the kids are being mean. How can you help kids have relationships with each other? I went into one high school classroom to get to know them. It was like December, so they'd been in school four or five months, 
The people in that class did not know each other's names. If you sat in the front, you didn't know the names of the 16 people behind you. And I'm like, how are you in school this many months and you don't know each other? Well, one thing you can do the moment you set foot in a classroom is orient students towards each other. That means instead of taking all of the spotlight for yourself, you're pointing them out to each other. So if a student says, I need help with this, and I've been watching, I might say, I bet Zoe can help you with that. She, I saw her over there. She's working on this. Zoe, can you come help this person? Now I've helped two students get connected and they have a relationship that might be supportive. Or if Stacy tells me something that's funny and Aaron is having a bad day, I might say, hey, Stacy, go tell Aaron the joke that you told me earlier. She needs to pick me up. And now I'm connecting kids and helping them get along with each other because the older students get, the more important peers become, right? So you might as well start helping them learn how to work together so they don't grow up to become adults who don't know how to work together. You have to be real deliberate about pointing them to each other, especially if you have, you know, there's a social hierarchy. This kid's popular. This one's not. This one's poor, doesn't have this, doesn't have that. The adults, how they treat students and how they orient them towards each other, the adults can minimize the impact of that kind of um, ranking behavior in school by asking students to work with each other. Does anyone have any examples of anything related in that way? Whether naming or um, an adult helping you get connected with another student? Or does this sound um, easy or hard? Or I'm also curious about your reaction to the suggestion that these are things you can do if you were to go into a classroom tomorrow. So um, while we wait for comments in the chat and hands, I just wanna share a couple, uh, a lot of students are, Really agreeing with what you're saying, simple things can make students feel more connected with people in their environment, making little efforts go a long way for students. And I feel like if the teacher makes the effort and having a good relationship with the student and respecting them, then students have more fun and enjoy the class. Mm -hmm. You know what's hard though? Sometimes remembering all of these things at once. So there's something about, <laughs> this is silly, but um, clipboards make adults super powerful in schools I don't know what it is about a clipboard that like scares people but if you go into a classroom and you have your ideas of like don't forget to do this or make sure you do that like don't sometimes the all this stuff is going on and you might forget like oh what were my strategies I wanted to try to make sure I connected with students and that I was really working for justice on Wednesdays when I go in and see them like don't be afraid to write things down to remind yourself uh, and if you put it on a clipboard, then students won't likely look because somehow that's like a very grown up thing they're not supposed to look at on the on the clipboard. Um, a few responses in the chat, I'll just read out. Um, that some of these examples that you've shared here, it would help me because personally, I wouldn't go up to someone and ask for help. I'm shy and nervous. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like teachers forget to make, oops, it's jumping around. I feel like teachers forget to make those connections with students and helping students get connected to other students. Um, and then a comment when teachers pronounce my name right, it makes me happy because people won't laugh at my name mm -hmm. because they said it wrong. I feel like pronouncing people's names is really important. It's so important and spelling too um because erica is spelled with a c and a k and whenever someone gets it right i'm always like they like me <laughs> they took the time to look we've worked together for two years why are you still spelling it with the k don't you care about me at all like i have these thoughts in my head um and and young youth and children might not necessarily have the words to explain what they're feeling, they only know that they feel badly. And when students don't feel good about themselves at school, they don't learn as well. 
And that's what we're there for. Um, we also have some students saying that they get kind of nervous when they try to get other to get to know other students in their class, um, that they don't interact with other students unless they speak up first. So sometimes using brief bursts of confidence and just to say hi and start up a conversation with them, which I think goes to prove like as a teacher or in a classroom, if you help um, sort of foster that relationship between students, how helpful that can be because students are sometimes shy and nervous. Absolutely. We're all shy and nervous, right? Even, even, even I remember when I started this job last December, I remember feeling like this place is so big and it's so quiet and will people like me and will I like them? You know, like you have all of these, these things. So it, it is a very human need to want to feel like you belong and that you're connected to other people. And sometimes adults really have to work at orchestrating that for others. It's, it's not easy. And for some students, they go through years of school, never knowing what it feels like to have like a partner that they can trust. It's, and it's just not fair because there are these little things we can do. And even you as a person who is in a practicum student who might see them 10 times and then never ever see them again in their whole life, you could do something, um, transformative and life-changing just by taking on some of these little moves. And Zoe, you were kind of pointing in this direction. So we're also talking about talking, like classroom discussion is just what happens when people talk to each other. And how do we make sure that people get to talking? I'm always worried. I've, I've been trained to go in and observe in classrooms and do evaluations. And I'm always nervous in a classroom that's too quiet. Cause that means that people aren't talking. And if they're not talking, they might not be thinking. So how do I, how do you get talking to happen when you're there? How do you get students talking that maybe would not talk otherwise. One thing you can do is when you're talking with students, ask how and why questions. It's that simple. Does, can I ask a question that requires more than one word of an answer? Can I ask people to explain their thinking? The easiest five words, tell me more about that. Oh, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I had fun. Tell me more about that. Oh, this is hard. I don't get it. What don't you get about that? Oh, this was fun. What parts did you like about it? Like, it, there's always one more question, one more question, one more question. And often, um, children and youth do not have an opportunity to have back and forth kind of volleying conversation um, with adults that they, and sometimes not even with each other if, the, if they're required to be silent in the classroom. So if you're not asking questions, right, you could always ask them to talk to each other. So let's say I ask a question and it's like, what do you think the most important part of a classroom is? Everybody's got an idea. But I call on the first person who puts their hand up and now everyone stops thinking because that person raised their hand. One move to, to um, encourage more discussion is before you call on a person, ask them to turn and talk to each other. Oh, I, I'm asking this question, I wanna know, everybody has a thought, turn and tell your neighbor what you're thinking about. Turn and tell your neighbor what's confusing. So before anybody gets to talk, everybody gets to talk. And then uh, like, let's say you have somebody that's like an attention hog and always wants to be the first person to answer a question. You know what you do? You say, hey, Zoe, share an idea you heard Aaron say. So now Zoe has to learn to be a better listener because I don't let Zoe talk about herself. I make Zoe tell me what Aaron said, right? And now I'm like subtly reinforcing these ideas that you, everybody gets to talk. and we're, so that's good, right? Everybody speaks, so I know everybody's thinking. 
I call on a few people. I might call on some that got it right, right away. I might call on some that are like, I was confused, but now I'm not. I might call on somebody that's like, hey, I'm still confused. That's a good, that's a teachable moment too. The point is that if students are talking, students are more likely learning. You can't predict anything at all that's happening when everybody's quiet. But if you're, everyone's talking, then you have a chance to hear how people are thinking. And that can help you if you wanna help students learn. And so from an academic standpoint, more talking is good. How and why questions is good. From a relationship standpoint, more talking is good because you can't have a relationship with a person that you don't speak to. And so you have to find opportunities to, to speak to students. When I was a classroom teacher, students, they had this folder that they brought their homework in every day. And I didn't allow them to just drop it in a basket. Every day you come in, you had to hand me the folder so I could look you in the face and say, good morning. We were gonna speak to each other and greet each other every day. And when somebody was like late and we missed that routine, they'd be like, are you gonna come over and say good morning to me or what? <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, we, we, <laughs> we missed the routine. Things feel off between us, right? Um, and the, sometimes we forget, you know, yes, you're responsible for all of these classroom pieces, but um, if you're really lucky, you end up with uh, 20, there's 20 students in a classroom, you're really fortunate to have 20 relationships with people, and those people have relationships with each other, and all of those relationships support the academic learning. So those are a couple of uh, tips that you can use if you were to go into a practicum, like, how questions, why questions, tell me more, get them to talk to each other and then listen and provide like coaching support from the side. Does anyone have any experiences around classroom discussion, inquiry or dialogue? You know, inquiry, you hear the word inquiry. Sometimes you hear inquiry in science. This just means asking questions, it means you're curious about something. Dialogue, talking back and forth. That's all it is, fancy words, talking, asking questions. Does anyone have any experiences that might connect with that? All folks are processing that. Um, there's some conversation in the chat just going around about like from a student perspective, mm -hmm. small groups and you know elbow partners and processing things together can actually help the social emotional health of a student and relieving some anxiety so that not everyone's looking at you when you're answering the teacher's question and just, you know, like really relieving some anxiety when you get to have that student interaction and that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there are, one thing I learned when I was, uh, and it was a hard lesson to learn as an educator, um, that I'm not gonna necessarily be every student's favorite person right? So they might not want to tell me if they're upset about something. So I need to know who that student will talk to so that if they're having a hard time and they need to talk to someone, I can get out of the way and put them with the person who's going to provide support and comfort. So definitely small groups. I would, I would, Anytime you can get groups down to four or five people, you're gonna have better discussion and people are gonna feel more satisfied with that experience. Um, I just wanna share, Diego has shared in the chat in Spanish class, we used to have to do entry tasks in Spanish and would talk about what we wrote in groups and then present it to the class. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Diego, when I was in Spanish class, um, and this was many years ago, we would trash talk each other in Spanish. Like we would, we would, we would say terrible things to each other, but the, uh, <laughs> and I'm not advocating that you do that because I'm an adult and I'm not supposed to encourage you to do bad things. However, we did talk to each other a lot more in Spanish when we knew we could play with words, 
right? And and then sometimes she'd come over and she'd like, you know, admonish us like, oh, you're not supposed to be saying stuff like that. But also they're talking to each other. So she had to kind of balance this, like, are we naughtiness that we were doing with like what we were gonna be able to learn from talking to each other and um, writing little poems and sometimes didn't quite do as much as like, I'm going to talk about your mom in Spanish and we're going to laugh about it because now we're better Spanish speakers. So there's all kinds of things you can do. Sometimes people, uh, what's it called? Sometimes people call it the dozens when, when people are like, go back and forth and tell your mama jokes and trash talk each other and try to win. Um, absolutely something you could do in a foreign language class within reason don't go back and tell anyone I told you that it was okay to be inappropriate at school I will deny that I said that this webinar is evidence that I am not telling students to misbehave at school thank you I was just going to remind you that we're recording <laughs> <laughs> yes don't do that um okay and then affirming classrooms right I heard classrooms where you feel good where you feel like you belong so what are some things you can do around diversity like if you go into a classroom and you see there are different groups of students you can look around the room and say okay well what identities do I see reflected in the classroom and then go and check out books about that so I might say oh Stacy, I remember you said that your dad's family is Greek I found a book about Greece do you want to look at it? But Stacy might be like, no, but it's okay. Because I wanted her to know I was thinking about her. And so if every time you come to the classroom, you show them, I'm thinking about you when you're not here. And you can see it in these books I brought with me. That would be like a very affirming thing next thing you know they're like students are all over you want to spend all their free time with you because you make them feel good about themselves if you around equity how do you show that you share ownership in the classroom how does this room become ours not just mine which is kind of a fine line because you don't want students to just like be wild but you also don't learn how to make good decisions if you never get to make decisions. So one way you share ownership with students is by allowing them to make all the, any decision or choices that they can. So we've got to read a book. Here's two books, which one do you want to read first? Does it matter to you which one you read first? No, you're going to read them both. Um, you have to do half of these problems. Do you want to do even or odd? doesn't matter to me. Um, we can do this or this after lunch. What do you want to do? You have two choices for homework. Which one? Like anytime you provide students with a choice, you empower them. They learn they have an opportunity to choose. So any place where you can provide a choice where it doesn't have to be you, give it to them. Someone told me once, if you are exhausted with all of the like paperwork tasks in a classroom, you have not given students enough work to do. Like, oh, I'm trying to staple all these things and get all these things. Which jobs can be given to students? How can we empower them to be a part of this? How can they own this space too? Anywhere there's a choice, you should offer it. Depending on the age, right? Like, so what you would, choices you would offer six-year-olds are not the choices you would offer 16-year-olds. They have to be real choices. And then uh, again, going back to inclusion, like inclusion belonging is hard to do in places where uh, that are too competitive, right? Like competition, there is a, such a thing as healthy and unhealthy competition and everyone needs to feel successful. And in, in a world where like, grade point average matters and who's at the top of the class and class rank, all of those things sometimes can make students feel like they don't belong. I'm not smart enough to be here. Um, uh, you know, everyone else has more than me, can do more than me. So well, what do you do? You praise effort as well as success. So when I was a classroom teacher, 
we were told we could not hang anything on a bulletin board outside of the classroom that was not top notch. You're only allowed to display the best work because you didn't want anybody thinking that you just accepted anything. And I remember as a teacher, I was like, I don't like that. I, I don't want to, that doesn't seem fair. What if someone is farther behind to start? Um, and so what I had was a personal and inside the classroom, no one could tell me what to do. So I was like, what's the purse? I made a bulletin board called my personal best. And every student selected something they were proud of and every student put something on display. So when you go into classrooms, you can talk to kids and say, hey, what's something you did well this week? What's something you learned that you understand better now than you did before? Where you're giving them a chance to talk about improvement because no one's perfect, right? But if you don't talk to them about how improvement and effort are also good, they think perfection is what they should be striving for. And that's not fair. That's not fair for people who actually have things to learn. School is a place to help you learn the things you don't know, not a place to judge you for what you don't already know. And then we get mixed up sometimes and you can make people feel more included by letting them know that's okay. And you can do that anytime you walk in a classroom with a student you don't even know. Tell me something you're working on. Tell me something you've gotten better at. So those are, those are three more ways that you could walk into a classroom tomorrow and help students who you don't know feel affirmed. And if you're thinking, I don't know anything about the students, how do I, how do I help students feel like they belong when I don't know them at all? It helps if you know yourself. So I think somebody said earlier, it helps when the teacher is real, when the teacher talks about things that are hard for them, when the teacher talks about mistakes that they make. Absolutely. I have a book, it's called Love That Dog by Sharon Creech. That book, it's my favorite book. I cry every time I read it. I've cried in front of students reading it. And one way, one way that I want them to feel affirmed is I'm like, this is my favorite book. It makes me so sad. It's so good. Do you have anything that you like to read that's like that? And if they say no, oh, well, I will bring you something next time and see if what your interests are. Maybe you like to read my book, right? Like whatever affirmation begins with connection. And sometimes that connection begins with you telling people about yourself in ways that um that are meaningful to you and you kind of have to be ready like i'm erica i'm uh, mary and jesse's daughter i'm one of five siblings i'm right in the middle i need to be around people to feel comfortable where i can talk and make mistakes if i go into a group of people and say that honestly like from my heart then all the people who are nervous are like, okay, I can be myself a little here too. And you, in doing so, you give students permission to be authentic and to belong. And you can do that very easily with just very small moves to make. Did we, I saw the chat, did we have anything we wanna bring up? Yes. Um, there are a few comments uh, related to much of what you just said. Uh, I feel it makes students feel like they weren't good enough, so they don't try anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and appreciation for some of your ideas, such as the wall inside the classroom to make students feel involved. Um, and then Ivy mentioned that um, we had an art teacher to make sure to grade us on trying our best in our artwork and working on improving it, but making sure to not compare our art to others. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? We've talked about, I'm giving you some strategies. Now we're just kind of open for business. What do you want to talk about? I'm going to put myself out there and say, I know that we've been talking about shyness and anxiety, but if anybody does want to speak um, versus use the chat, we would totally love to hear that. And if not, we also very much understand. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I will tell you, I am a painfully shy person. Like if I wasn't the person delivering this talk, it would probably be hard for me to like, I would still do it because sometimes I'm, I fake it till I make it right. Where I'm just pretending to be brave, like I'll give it a shot. <laughs> but um, you don't have to worry about how I might respond. I just want to hear what you have to say. Are there any of these ideas that you think would be easier for you to try? I put them down thinking these are doable. I guess I'm curious, do they feel that way to you? Is this something you could see or any one of these strategies, something you could see yourself uh, really taking up? I feel it is a good idea to have the students be in groups and then that way they will feel more comfortable with the group and eventually will probably talk to the whole class. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sometimes people get nervous about students being in groups because they're like, they're going to talk and they might even talk about me right? Like the teachers get nervous. So I will tell you that they will talk and they probably will talk about you. And sometimes they'll be off track and it'll be totally fine. Like people would get like, nobody's on task all day long. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm supposed to work eight hours a day, which I do, but I'm like, not always at the computer, totally focused all eight hours. Sometimes I get distracted, there's a noise, I have a conversation with a friend. Like when we do our own thing, we're not as rigid. And so we have to create those small group spaces where it's a little bit more reflective of real life. We can be off task a little bit. Then you walk around, you nudge people, hey, get, get back to business. And they're like, ah, okay, yeah, I'll get back to business. Like it, it the things, it's not a prison. It's supposed to be a place that empowers and, and sets students up to be free. Uh, so we have to make spaces where that's possible. Uh, just a couple more comments in the chat. I think really reiterating the themes that we've talked about, smaller groups, um, chances for connection, and this idea of how damaging it can be to compare students, um, because that really just takes the motivation out of there. Of, out of them. Mm -hmm. Especially if you are in a community where you might see siblings in the same classroom, like my kindergarten teacher was my brother's kindergarten teacher who was 11, seven years older. My brother's seven years older than me. And so like, if you are in a school or a community where you're seeing multiple members of the same family, it's really important to have connections with students where it is personal. You're not just be like, oh, your brother did the same thing. Like they don't wanna hear what their sibling did. They need to be uh, the focus of who's in front of you. Any last thoughts, comments, questions before we wrap up? Okay. I got it. Like I made the screen, you know, this. There we go. I had to move the videos out of the way. So, okay, so here's the last thing I would like to ask you to do. Uh, just as a way of letting me know, um, I know some of you put things in the chat, some folks spoke, uh, but I would really love to hear from individuals just as we wrap up, like a three word reflection. I've been talking to you for approximately 
50 minutes or so. At the end of those 50 minutes, you're thinking about something. So in three words, put in the chat what your reflection is on this discussion. What are your takeaways? And you only get three words, not more than three words, not less than three words, three words. As you put your three word reflections in the chat, I know there's 29 people. Some of you are educators, so I wouldn't expect uh, teachers to do it. But I will ask uh, the educators on the call, um, what takeaways do you have? What, what did you notice or wonder about our discussion? Stacey, are those reflections coming in? Yes, and for some reason, I just assumed that you were reading them all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, no, I was just letting them. I, I don't know. I don't know why I did that. Um, I could read them after. I just was like, I was looking at the pictures, so I didn't. Um, I didn't that see. makes complete sense. I just, you know, it's I'm role modeling how um, to be human and make some mistakes over here. So I'm just going to read out a few. Uh, interesting, informing, important. Students voices heard, mind shifting teaching. Next time let's do a haiku. Um, <laughs> connection, students, a lot of teaching, um, a lot of connection, relationships, communication, listening, informative, so much about connections um, and relationships. Encouragement. And I will say, I'll leave you with this. You do not have to wait until you have a degree and a credential to change the life of children and youth. You can do it right now. So don't wait. You might be the, the one thing that uh, keeps a student in school. You might be the one thing that, um, that, that just keeps them going by by demonstrating what it means to be a good human to someone else's child so don't don't forget that um, that that opportunity is not available to anyone um, but something that that you get to do because you opted into this particular course so take advantage of it you never know whose life you're changing and with that, I will close. I just want to, I put this in the chat. Thank you, Erica, for making time. Um, thank you to my coworkers at PESB, but more, most importantly, students, thank you for making time. I know life is crazy for everyone right now, and I imagine your school schedules are all over the place. So we just really appreciate you being here and sharing um, your thoughts and ideas and experiences. Um, we are going to try to continue these, even though I think everyone's moving back into some schedules are changing again. Um, but uh, if you have time to just complete this quick survey, it gives us a good idea of what we can do to improve this experience for you. But thank you, everyone. We sincerely appreciate all of your time.